Our very special guest on This Week in Pensado Place is you, an expanded version of Corner Office. Join us. This Week in Pensado Place kicks off right now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Pensado's Place, episode four, right, Dan? Five? Five? Five. 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 Episode five. Ten. But time flies when Ten. you're having fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're having fun. Yeah. So next week will be episode four and a half, right? Is this a full episode this week? Yeah. Okay, so it counts? It counts. Good. I'm Dave Pensado, as you haven't figured that out. Um, and we really welcome you to the show. You guys have been lighting up the chat rooms and the email and... Um, We've made a, our best effort to accommodate everybody. By the way, this is my wingman, Herb. Hey, hi, hi everybody. Man? Good to see you again. Thanks for coming in. You know, we want to hear from you. And this week we're doing something a little bit different. Um, so make sure you get to uh, our chat room, which is powered by Ustream. Zan has got it over here. We call that the corner office. And we're going to spend a lot of time getting to your questions. You're also going to hit us at Twitter. Our handle's at Pensado Place. And we also... Uh, uh, you have our Facebook page, the YouTube channel, our blank notepads and 5 by 3 by 5 cards, whichever way. But get to us because what we want to try to do periodically is make sure we're getting to your questions. We've, we love the response. We've been getting a lot of response. So um, this is the week to do it. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try. Uh, that, was a, that was a weird segue. Yeah. But anyway, I'm in a good mood today, as you can tell. I, 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 I've been wanting to do this show for a while because, uh, according to what you've been telling me, you want a little more of this, so we're going to give it to you. Uh, so we should, we should, this should put an end to that wanting more of this real quick. Um, this week, I'm the guest, so you guys have good questions for me, right? Yep. Okay. And um, uh, ITL this week, we're going to continue what we showed last week. Zan uh, filmed me showing how I break down a session and, and that kind of stuff. Remember, we're going to go into a lot more of, of what you saw on this week and last week's ITL. Each one of those little things can be a segment in and of its own right. So for you hardcore guys, we're going to break that down. And then um, after ITL, I'm going to come, like they say back home, I'm going to come philosophize, Lord willing, if the creeks don't rise. And Herb, what we got in CO today, I hear it's a special CO today? It's a special CO, and which is going to be expanded. Um, so get in the chat room, be aggressive. Um, you can ask lots of questions on a variety of topics, uh, certainly about mixed techniques, certainly about stuff in that genre. There are things around the peripheral of being a mix engineer or mixing from management to business affairs to all kinds of stuff. So take a shot at that, and we're going to um, try to feed you full of uh, information that hopefully is useful. And um, rather than us belaboring the point, Dave, mm -hmm. what do you think? Why don't we get it kicked off? Let's do it. ITL. ITL. For everybody watching the show today, I wanted to say personally I really appreciate uh, you guys watching. I'm doing this for you. I, I had a really rough week this week and lost a lot of sleep, but I, I managed to squeak out with help of my good buddy Zan a couple of into the lair. So let's see here. Let me play this vocal. Okay, we, we double track. Been using channel strip lately. Before. After. Compressor. Just kissing it. Alrighty. Let's move on down. Uh, let me show you uh, Ray J's vocal. Uh, Mr. Ray J. Weirdo, how you dance like that? Shouty, use a weirdo. Shouty, use a yeah, that's weirdo. That's Ray J in the hook. Uh, this is kind of complex. Ox 2, what I'm trying to do here is just add a little bit of distortion on the Futz box. Um, you can hear just the Futz box track. And then I'm using three L1s in a row to make sure this thing is like a, the ultimate brick wall limiter. Use a 
you can notice the outputs are just slightly up so that it gives the next one something to do okay now this is the track without the distortion same thing just some EQ some uh, pretty standard stuff using the same the same compressor that we used on the stereo bus I just like I like this one for kissing things kissing just barely touching it now we add the distortion back DSer, Massey DSer. I like this DSer a lot. Without it, okay. Everything else, pretty pretty standard stuff here. Um, there's a key that closes everything. Oh, let's, let's check this bass. I love what I did to the bass. Check this out, guys. Let me show you the before. Ah, uh huh. That's a before and after, isn't it? Okay, here we go. Stomp box. Guitar amp. Our bass. Pretty cool. I like that. I like that. All right. Just getting some kick drums real quick. Okay, basically, I'm taking all these kick drums and sending them. This is the program for kick drums. I'm sending them to an aux. You can see all that. You can figure out the signal path. Just just pause your tape. Interesting thing here is I'm I'm taking a piece of uh, this particular drum and. Um, and I'm 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 feeding it bus 4748 coming in here. We talked about we, oh we're going to talk about this in a, in a show real soon. This is a parallel compression technique. Not going to spend too much time on that. These 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 numbers I got off of a chart uh, from the 160 XT DBX. And then uh, boosting a little bit at 60, attenuating the heck out of that signal. The the high end at 3k you can study that okay and then uh, the next thing I'm doing here is using the uh, my new favorite uh, drum replacement this is the trigger uh, I made up this sound it reminded me of Stargate who I really am a big fan of so that's why I call it Stargate but um, here again we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this adding that into the sample so here's without the trigger. Just just adding adding a little bit of low end, and then uh, let me just do an AB with the parallel compression chain. I hope you guys can hear this on on your systems at home. It none of this is gonna change music but it's a combination of lots of little things that make a, a great mix. Uh, snare time. Okay. Air reverb for a little reverb. Here again, th here's my parallel compression track. Nothing high level here, just uh, same situation except this time I'm adding a ton of 10k on the parallel track and I'm using the H comp for that again. Check that out. Pretty cool stuff. N nothing dramatic. Uh, what am I doing to the snare? Looks like I probably couldn't even hear that. It looks good. All right. Hi-hat. Adding some top end. Okay, same thing on down the line. Let's see. Okay, now let's go to the live drums. The live drums, same situation. They've got their own little aux right here. Live drum aux. Uh, there again, I'm paralleling some compression in there. Let's 
Let's start with kick and snare. Now I'm hitting this pretty doggone hard. I like the sound of that. This is adding to the original signal. Uh, that's what I got on my kick. Here's the parallel chain on the kick we, we talked about before. Here's, a, here's on the live kick. Not as much attenuation. Taking out a little bit at 400. When I'm working, I don't know what numbers I'm doing. Snare, ooh. If you'll notice that it says CLA snare one. I started out with that preset, kind of modified it for my needs on this. Chris's presets are excellent, by the way. Uh, here's the we are here's here's the what I'm using as a parallel chain on the snare. This here again, same sample, same uh, settings, except this is a little slower than I normally slower attack than I would normally use. I'm mixing that back in low end on the pull tech, top end from the API, H comp, just just trying to get a little thwack, a little smack without it. Oops. With it. Ooh. I like that. Okay. On and on and on and on. Now I've got um to me, the high end is of the live drums is, is is what really gives you that 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 live flavor, especially the rooms and the overheads. When I add that in, you can really hear a big difference. Uh, back the tape up when I add it in. This is what I'm adding to that. Okay. And last but not least. The guitars. This this blue track here and this blue track here were what Brent originally recorded for the guitars. Um, this is going 63, 64. Here we go. Okay, now Brent ran that through uh, G11. After he did, uh, when I got the G11, I added, uh, this is before I got it. Okay, here's what Brent gave me. This is what I did to it. Like I, I, that's a recorded version of this is what I added to it. Let me go through that again. A little bit of limiting. This is the effects that I added. A little more limiting and a little more limiting. There again, just to, just to get a brick wall effect. All this is doing is adding a little definition to the attack. Think of it as the, the pick noise. Uh, if, you, if you've got a good stereo system, it's widening, widening the stereo feel. And last but not least, our organ sound. Um, okay, what well, we did the organ. Here's without what I did. Okay, E6. I'm rolling on some top end. You can see that right here. Here's without it. Just there's a little clicky sound I didn't like. Not not the B3 kind of percussive sound. This was a, a noise that was kind of interfering, not a noise, but a sound, a frequency that was interfering with the guitar, top end on the guitar. Then I wanted it to be a little bit more on the edges, have the guitar take up more space. So this widens me a little bit. I push the sides up. 
and then give it a little bit of a a, a mutron kind of mutron biphase kind of sound. The gain goes down, but adjust it yourself. And that's it. That's uh, around the world in in 12 minutes. Almost an impossible task, but I think we we got you a little bit of flavor and vibe, and we can build some more into the layers on any one of these subjects, just let me know. All righty, guys, next time. Welcome back. That was uh, part two of the ITL uh, that we did not last week, but we did the week before. Uh, again, get into our chat room, which we call the corner office. We're gonna, this is an expanded version of that. And um, our, our guest this week is a guy who's been here every week. <laughs> which is going to be Dave. All right. And uh, I think they want to spend some time giving you a perspective and a point of view of some of the things and yeah. get to some specific questions. You know what, um, Herbs, and let's, let's talk about the best way to use this show. In other words, um, there's, a, there's an entertainment factor here because some of the facts can get a little overwhelming. And then not everybody's at the same level, so some people are going to be bored by the simpler stuff. Some people are going to be bored by the more technical stuff. But the best way to use this show, I'm going to give you an example. When I, I'm self-taught. Not really, but I pretend like I am. I had a lot of really talented people teach me. I wasn't formally taught. And along the way, I read a magazine article that said, um, you should always take 300 out of your kick drums. For about the first three years of my career, I ruined a lot of kick drums because I took 300 out of every kick drum. I took 300 out of floor toms because they looked like kick drums. I took 300 out of snares because they were near kick drums and should. Anyway, what I'm telling you is you guys want me to give you detail, detail, de details, and I want to do that because it gives me a chance to show off, and my ego enjoys that. But at the same time, sometimes I feel like my responsibility to you guys because you give me so much uh, faith and confidence and, 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 and give me such warm responses. I feel like my responsibility is to teach you how to fish rather than give you the fish, that old cliche. So with that in mind, uh, I'm going to philosophize a little, little bit, uh, answer some of your questions. I, I got some wonderful questions this week. Let's start off simple. Uh, I film with Zan. We do it together. Um, into the Lair. We filmed that at Larrabee Studios, uh, which is where I have a room with our next week's guest. I don't want to give the plot. Can I give the plot away? Absolutely. Manny American is going to be our guest next week. Manny uh, is nominated this year for Best Engineer Grammy with uh, my newfound friend, uh, Michael Brower. I've been talking to Michael all week. We're going to get Michael on the show, I hope. And then also Jason, Josh Jason Joshua, one of my former assistants who's just lighting up the world, doing incredible work. Anybody knows I didn't say amazing? Okay. So, um, okay, no more amazing jokes. I, I got it, I got it, I got it. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, let's come up with some ways to humi humiliate Zan this time. Not, no more amazing jokes. Take your best so shots, I, 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 We film it at Larrabee with those, where the three of us have, have our own rooms there. And then uh, periodically we film at Vibrant Street, which is my project studio. A lot of you guys wanted to know what that little thing with the blinking blue lights was. That's an RTA, real-time analyzer. Some people, uh, sometimes they refer to as spectrum analyzers. Uh, that one's made by Audio Control, uh, which is a company that manufactures uh, a myriad of products. But the interesting thing, and I don't want to waste time on this because you guys want meat. You're going to get meat. But the interesting thing is they sell a lot to people who enter these contests to see who has the loudest sound system in their car. You can believe that, Herb? Yeah, I do and, believe and, that. And, and there's, a, there's an organization called MACE. Uh, um, I wrote it down. I'm going to use my notes a lot today, so bear with me. Um, uh, what is it called? Mobile Audio Electronic something or other. Anyway, MECA, Mobile Electronic Car Association. Anyway, look up MECA and then type in cars. It, it, these guys, the, the winner uh, with his microphone six feet away from his car is registering 156 dB. Wow. That's like 90 dB over 40 hours is considered enough to make you deaf. That's crazy. I mean, it's like jet engines are only like a few dB louder than that. Insane. Okay. Um, a lot of questions I get are about converters, so let's put that to rest. 
10 years ago, you had to be concerned about what converters you were using. Nowadays, the, the top companies all make such incredible converters, the difference is just negligible. I happen to have some favorites, so I'm going to share that with you, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that the others aren't quite good. I happen to not like the color pink, so I might not mention those converters. My favorite converters right now. <laughs> that was a good day. My favorite converters are the ones made by Avid. They call them the HD IOs. Uh, I have a couple of those, and I love them. Uh, I'm going to tell you how I clock those in a minute. Another converter, uh, we had Dylan on the other day. Dylan is partial to the Aurora, the Lynx. Those are great converters. Um, the. Um, uh, uh, I'm leaving one out. If I think about it, I'll tell you about that later. Is it antelope? Well, the clock, a clock with an antelope clock, uh, a lot of people use the big bin, which is fine. Uh, I like um, the antelope. I just recently replaced my big bin with an antelope, and I feel like I get a little tighter top in, a little brighter top. Now, when I say these kind of things, we're splitting hairs. It's, 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 it's subtle, but, but there. And, most engineers will mix to what they're hearing. So if you have a converter and a clock that's giving you a little lo less low end than another one, probably you're going to mix so that you hear that low end and eventually compensate for it. We're that good nowadays. So <clears throat> the clock, I think, I, I think it's called an OCXV uh, is the one I like. They make one for $10,000 that's just, that's just stupid. It's just too much money yeah. But um, for clocking. One of the questions I get a lot is about uh, depth and width of my mixes. Uh, Zan, who's, who's the, somebody asked me about that. Yes, somebody certainly did. Uh, that was Freddie K. actually. It's part of one of the questions. Is Freddie? You, yeah. Okay. Freddie, I uh, appreciate the question. Um, there's a new plug-in. We talked about it with Dylan, this Dr. MS. That will, that will give you width. Uh, Waves has a series, uh, the PS and the uh, S, uh, the imager series, those are good for adding width to your mix. But I'm going to tell you uh, a couple of things to try. Be careful with this one. If you've got, a, if you've got like, say, a stereo track of strings, shift the whole, uh, convert it to, 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 to mono. So you, 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 you convert your stereo track to dual mono, two monos, left and right. Shift the left track uh, that you're panning left, shift that early like seven milliseconds, shift the, the, the right track late to seven milliseconds. I think I mentioned that in a magazine article. And then hit the mono button, see if your compatibility is still good. And if it's not, to heck with it. Does a, does a TV producer worry about the customers that still have black and white TVs? Should we worry about st you know mono anymore? If you have a mono system, you should be penalized. Okay. That'll, that'll widen the track out a little bit. Another thing to try and do is, on most keyboards, stereo is not stereo. It's actually, a lot of times, they'll just put a chorus on one side and the sound on the other. So that clouds up the middle of your mix. What we're trying to do is, is, is get clarity in different parts of the mix. So if you've got um, keyboard parts that, 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 that aren't really, that don't leave you, a little gap in the middle, pan them to one side and then pan the effects the other way. Stereo on a reverb return mostly is not stereo. Try this. Put up uh, two plugins with the same preset, reverb preset. Pan one plugin hard left even though it's stereo. Pan the other plug in hard right and just slightly have different parameter changes. So like change the reverb time, change some of the decay characteristics, change the pre-delay. And that'll give you the same reverb effect, but it'll leave you a nice space in the middle. Experiment with that. Remember my 300 cycle on the kick drum thing. I'm not going to give you every little detail, but if you want me to, I will later. So um, try those kind of techniques. Also, um, you know what, I just had a thought. Another cool thing to try is if you're doing a ballad or if the, if the vocals are in a really low range, try running the send to the reverb through a harmonizer. Put that up an octave. So now what you're sending to your reverb unit is not the same octave as what 
the original sound source is, but it's an octave higher. Now, when you mix that back in with the vocal, it's, it's, gonna, it's a real cool effect. It makes the vocal seem a little more exciting. Um, another, another thing to try is, is take a, a chorus, take two chorus units, pan one left, and at, say, maybe a little ways almost right, but say maybe... I don't know how to describe panning. I guess I guess I would say if you're using a, a knob, you would pan one side left and you'd pan one side at about one or two o'clock. Then take another course unit and, and change the depth and the rate to where they're slightly different. Pan that one hard left and maybe at ten o'clock. And then delay both of those edges, the, the, the parts that are panned hard left and right, delay those like anywhere, try 14 milliseconds to start with, and then feed background vocals to that, things like that. So, so philosophically, to teach you how to fish part, is think of ways to clear out the middle, think of ways to give the impression of things outside the stereo field. Now in the analog world, um, there's an inexpensive, inexpensive piece of gear, um, it, it's made by Behringer, it's called an Edison. I think I paid like Mine has transformers in it, so I think I paid about 250 but you can get those really cheap on eBay. Oh, speaking of eBay, uh, I did a little work for you guys today, and I noticed one or two uh, of, the, of the audio control units on eBay. One of them, I think, was full retail. Don't buy that one. I see them on eBay every once in a while for $400, $500. Don't pay, some, don't pay new for something like that, because when you get tired of it. A little later on in the show... Um, if I have time, I'm going to talk about how to use that thing, because that, that, that was a good question. Uh, Mr. Friedman, F.L. Friedman, asked a, a question about management. I can tell you how to be managed, but we happen to have one of the most knowledgeable, successful managers here to my left. Zan. <laughs> I don't manage you. But, but tell Mr. Friedman, Herb, he, he wanted to know what's the importance of management and why management for engineers and producers. Just focus on engineers, maybe. Um, I think that any time you have a mixture of commerce and timing and clients and responsibility, um, there has to be an infrastructure that can organize all that. Because if you don't have that process correct, you'll affect the creative process. And that's not fair to the client and obviously to your personal client. So you're in a mode of having to protect but also make sure that we're responsible to the people who are paying those folks. Um, and then what happens, I think, that if you are ambitious and you want to maintain a certain standard, then you have to um, pay the price. Now, one of the things about that is that there's an art to learning how to be managed. And um, most superstars learn that. It's not automatic. Um, Can you give us an example of that? Well, um, we know artists who often get in their own way by either being petulant or disagreeable or and what you find with the, the larger superstars is those issues may still happen but they happen behind the scenes and what's generally presented is a sort of a kind of cohesion and a, a way where um, the manager feels like fighting for you because it's such a personal relationship. Yeah. It, it really is like a marriage. And, and the fact that there's a, a, a sort of, there's a sense of pride about what you're doing. When you asked me to get back involved with you, uh -huh. I, I knew it was a gold standard and we started this 30 years ago. So uh -huh. to come back and do what we're doing, uh -huh. I just think we're having fun. Oh, yeah. But, but it becomes easy. So what I would well, I say... Have, I have the fun. You clean up the mess. Well, <laughs> but that part is fun for me because yeah. I represent something good. So it, it, it's just one of those things that you want to do and search organically. Um, it has to feel right in your gut, and then the results will show both in your work and, and hopefully in your income as well. Great answer. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Ed Ledeau. I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. He works at down at the Hit Factory in Miami. He sent me a great question. Uh, questions. You read that too, Herb. It was pretty well written. I mean, you, you could start a show. But Ed, I ain't going to type that much, my friend. Good grief. My thumbs are like nubs now handling this. Okay, hit, er, you guys. Hit, er. Uh.
I didn't know if I was hit or <laughs> hurt. Okay. From now on, all questions need to be true-false. No questions will be answered. I'm just kidding. I want true-false questions from now on, or, or yes, no questions. Good grief, you guys. And um, I want to give, I want to say thanks to um, uh, a couple other guys that sent in some great questions. Jorg, or Jorg, I think, um, I think that's pronounced, Donald Valdez, uh, Ravian in the Netherlands. Um, anyway, great questions. I'm going to talk about vocals right now. I get a lot of questions about how do I treat vocals. This is going to fly pretty fast, so um, we'll expand on this in an end to the lair. Yeah. I think, I think that would be a good one, don't you, Absolutely. Jane? Okay. On vocals, uh, I work two ways on vocals. Uh, actually, I work, let's say I work three ways. If I'm all analog, which I really don't do too much anymore, I would, I would probably go to um, a millennia, the, the, the EQ, the equalizer. I love those millennia. It, it ha you can select a tube, insert it into your signal chain. It gives you um, a real nice clear top end. Uh, so I like to EQ with that. I like to do my uh, broad brush strokes with that. I like to do my repair work with like a GML 8200. And then I like to run everything after that to a tube tech. It's uh, my favorite analog vocal. And then on songs like Beautiful, any Brian McKnight hit, um, early Beyonce, like Check On It. Uh, that was the number one I had with her. Um, I think Single Ladies, I think I used a tube tech on her. But, any, but um, uh, I like the Gates compressor. It's called a stay level. It, it was uh, we talked about that in an earlier into the layer. Now, on on the plug-in side, when I'm working in the box, what I tend to do is I tend to do my my precision work with the Flux equalizer. You go to their website; they make a, a bun bunch of stuff, but the, the 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 big one, the big equalizer, I like. And then for color and for uh, vibe and stuff, I like to use an API 550. And then I also like the Waves um, Neve emulator. I think it's uh, the V series, V3. Yep. There's a V3 and a V4. I like the I like the I like the V3. I use that a lot. And then my favorite compressor for vocals, and as you saw into the layer, I use it a lot, is the Waves 1176. I like the blue stripe version of that for vocals and the black for everything else. You know, I have a question for you because you mentioned something. Hmm? Didn't um. Michael J. Fox used a flux capacitor in uh, Back to the Future. I, I think you got that confused with your... 1280. No, I was going to make, make a genitalia joke about enlargement, but it's probably not appropriate for this. Nah, nah, okay. nah. That's more my, it's more my area anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know what? We got a ton of people okay. in, in the in corner office. Why don't oh. we expand what you're saying? Okay. Let's get some questions in because it, it's okay. full. Okay. All right. Zane, you want to sh shoot us some? Yes. Okay, well, hold on. Before we go, I had a long speech about room treatment. If you're angry about me not talking about room treatment, treatment, send your send your criticisms to Andrea and Will at thisweekend.com. Let's get to some questions. Okay, speaking of which, Dave, the the first question I'm going to ask is from Donald Valdez. Actually, it says if I bought good studio monitors but don't treat my room like with panels or what have you. Oh. Can I still get a nice professional sounding mix? And is learning my room enough, or is it a battle not worth fighting? Donald, my friend, I'm going to squeeze this room treatment thing in after all. Don't write Andrea and Will. Write uh, Ian and Kenny. All right. <laughs> room treatment. I think room treatment is probably more important than the quality of your monitors. Now, if you've got real crummy monitors, then you're in trouble. But I'm talking about past a certain level of quality of, of your monitor, the room's going to affect what you're doing. Um, I've just built a new place, and I'm getting a little extra 200, and I'm getting a little bit of sound reflections. I spent about, I don't know, 40, 50 hours cruising around the Internet, and I, I actually feel pretty confident about what I learned. Uh, basically, it takes mass to, to control the low end a little bit, so... Uh, you can control different amounts of low ends if it's too much in your room, which tends to be the problem, not too little, by various thicknesses of plywood. The reflections tend to be a problem. You can control that with some foams. And uh, actually, uh, Lone Slash gave me some foam, and that really helped a lot in my room. Um, 
I've made some notes that I'm looking at. Uh, the physics involved with, with rooms are very complex. I've, I've gone and been the first guy in a $4 million room, and it sucked. Sucked as a physics terms. Uh, and, and, and they had to spend a lot of time correcting it. So I would say it's, it's a bit of a trial and error process. If you're fortunate enough to, to, to work with Bob Hodas, who tunes my rooms for me, or uh, Thomas, you, you, you speak French. Jean Jean, Jean yeah. say it in French. You know, I forgot the spelling, but it's oh, Jean Joie, I believe. It's Jean Joie. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, Thomas Croissant, he, he's he's one of the best there is. Uh, J O U A N J E A N. He's really good at tuning rooms, and he's 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 he's, he's reasonably priced. But uh, Herb is uh, moving a lot. That means I need to move on to the one next more, question. One more question, and we'll wrap it up. What you got, Zan? Wrap up the whole show? Uh, on live drums, this is a question from Jeff Braun. For live drums, if I move individual tracks in my drum group forward or backward a few milliseconds to correct phase problems, will I run into any issues? Wow, that's, that's a good question. I experimented with that early on. I was terrified to do live drums, and so I spent weeks and weeks and weeks just practicing, and I, I tried different things like that. Uh, I think in his full email he mentioned a plug-in that actually allows you to do some phase shift, if I recall that yeah, I email. I the name. I actually just... Yeah. yeah. No, no, I, I, I appreciate that. But it does show I read your emails, by the way. Um, I would be careful. A minute ago I talked about shifting uh, stereo tracks one way and the other way. You've got to be very, very careful that you don't affect the groove or anything. Uh, with drums, I tend to just... Live drums... Uh, in fact, you saw it on the end of the layer, the last two that we did. I tend to flip phase a lot, and uh, probably I, right now uh, it was Donald, right? Uh, Jeff, Jeff Braun. Jeff. Yeah. I thought Donald. Yeah, yeah. Jeff asked the question. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, if 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 you if you feel pretty good about your skill level, I would shift some stuff, but I would definitely. If you're working in Pro Tools, I definitely duplicate the track so you can get back to what you had quickly. Uh, my first preference would be to uh, flip the phase on it. But philosophically, he, here's here's your teach you how to fish moment. Uh, philosophically, think of the drums as one instrument, not a a bunch of individual drums. They're individual drums that are mic'd individually, but the sum of it is one instrument. Uh, if you listen to old Led Zeppelin, uh, John Bonham would only allow two microphones on his drums, one on the kick, a ways away, and then, and then a, an overhead. That could be mythology, if it is, correct me. Uh, but uh, I've been believing that for a long time. And um, so, so you can mic drums with, uh, with two microphones. They sound like they're having more fun outside than we are in here. I sure love it. Why? Why? Because it's time for us to go, unfortunately. So, do us a favor. Make sure you hit us at our Twitter handle, at Pensado Plays. Obviously, our email, PensadoPlays at ThisWeekend.com. Facebook page, YouTube channel, uh, This Weekend YouTube channel. Um, thanks for coming to our chat room. Um, Dave's going to tell you about our guest next week when we get out of here. And again, keep your comments and questions and stuff coming. Who we got next week so we can say goodbye? We've got Manny American, a good friend of mine, a very, very talented engineer. Manny um, is nominated with, like, like I said, Michael Brower for the John Mayer record this year for Best Engineer. He also does all the Alicia Keys records, a lot of Kanye West. Manny is a lot like Dylan and Jean Marie and um, uh, Tony, and, the, and he does some rock, he does some R&B, he does some rap. He's, he's very talented. We're going to learn a lot. I'm going to learn a lot. I, I work in the same studio with him, and I bug him every day about yeah. how to do things. He is absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and brilliant. then in the future, we're, we're, we're going to have Chris Anacute. He's uh, the A&R person. Uh, when he was at Capital EMI, he signed Katy Perry here. He did. And uh, he's working over with your close friend, Sylvia, over at Motown now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've also talked with uh, Brian Gardner, mastering engineer. We're going to ask him about L2, Joe Ciccarelli, uh, John, I mean, uh, Jack Joseph Puig. So anyway, we really appreciate you watching this week. I hope you learned something. If you like this, let us know. If you don't, let us know. And we'll, we'll be back next week with Manny, a, a new fresh into the lair. And keep those cards and letters coming. Adios.